This is the world. Around and revolving some amazing man-made satellites. Launched into space from Soviet Russia. What sort of human effort first produced these satellites? What sort of people? What sort of nation? Recently, some motion pictures were made in that nation, about which we know so little, by a man from the Western world, and here he is, Mr. Sid Fetter. He has a proper passport, tickets issued by Intourist, the Soviet government travel agency, and a new long focus Zoomar lens, which he's not quite sure he knows how to operate. And here he is in Russia. Here I am, he says to himself, actually taking motion pictures in a country which for so long has been forbidden Russia. My transportation has been arranged, my permits are all applied for, and I hope I brought along enough film, because I want to take back home a photographic record of everything I'm going to see. Let's pretend I'm Mr. Sid Fetter, just arrived in Moscow. En route to my hotel, I recognize the Cathedral of St. Basil, built by Ivan the Terrible, who, legend says, had the architect's eyes put out so he wouldn't ever surpass this achievement. Passing the famed historical museum, I arrive at the Hotel Moscow, the newest in the city, and mostly reserved for visiting delegations, mainly from other Iron Curtain countries. I find military and political MVD police patrol the hotel main entrance. As a matter of fact, they watch all entrances and exits, day and night. Here in Tourist provides me with a deluxe five-room suite, but I'm no sooner in it than I learn that not only my schedule, but every detail of my Russian visit must conform to in tourist pattern, down to when and where I eat my meals. On the streets, it's apparent that everyone must carry identification papers, since no one knows when the MVD will ask for them. Present everywhere is the state-owned ice cream cart, despite Moscow winter temperatures of 30 below. The main thoroughfare, Gorky Street, is crowded with pedestrians, including visitors of a million a day from all over Russia. Official visitors, all of them, for it seems no Russian may travel except with official permit which states where he can go and what he can do. In summer, the Moscow floating population climbs to two million. The government ice cream cart really does business, for it's hot here, even though Moscow is on the same parallel as Sitka, Alaska. These Russians, plus the thousands of men in uniform, all give the Moscow street scene an exciting aspect of fantasy. I begin to wonder just what Russia is. Already I've learned that the 260 million Soviet people speak some 300 different dialects, that they publish newspapers in 119 different languages, and that more than half of them are not Russian at all. Many of the automobiles are Kremlin cars. And since the chauffeurs work for the state, the pedestrian learns to keep out of the way. Prominent in Moscow is the state-operated department store, the Goom, spelled G-U-M, pronounced Goom. My visit to the Goom is chaperoned by an in-tourist guide interpreter. Her name so complicated, I promptly christen her Miss Moscow. First on your schedule, Mr. Feder, is the very newest department in the Goom. That is why there is a long line of waiting customers. But with your special permit, you will not have to wait. This project is under the supervision of the Department of Culture. A fashion show. Like women everywhere, we are eager to see the new style. 
All these creations are Russian designs and Russian models. But from the faces, the sales seem beyond the comprehension of the customer. The state food stores are called the gastronome shops. I found no shortage of food in Moscow, except perhaps for meat and eggs. Things like clothing, house furnishings, and appliances are in short supply. So the Moscow worker has rubles to spend freely for food. But there's a special routine to make a purchase. You locate what you want, you stand in line to learn if it's available and how much it costs. Then you queue up in another line and buy that particular food ticket from a cashier. Then you line up again and you acquire the desired food. Unless what you've selected has been sold out in the meantime. In which case you stand in another line at the cashiers to get your money back. The bookkeeping is kept straight by the ancient abacus. I ask Miss Moscow where these people live. Many of them live in our skyscraper apartments. But this is Stalin architecture and has been permanently abandoned for something better. The full truth was once printed in Moscow. The plaster is falling off, the plumbing disastrously out of order, and the elevators rarely operate. It seems the basic construction was faulty. But behind these lofty cockle shells is hidden the living pattern for a great mass of Moscow's population. Narrow streets lined with apartment houses. The cobblestones all too often trod by the frequent tragicomic drunkard. The apartments all too apparently occupied three or four to a room, nine by 12 feet, with cooking, washing, and toilet facilities in a community hallway. But prominent are the thousands of antennas on the rooftops. I have no in-tourist chaperone here, but later Miss Moscow mentions that the city will soon have a million television sets, and the newest models have a giant 12-inch screen. In one of these districts, a group of Jews recently ventured to identify their house of worship by placing over the entrance in Hebrew the words, this is a house of God. And so far, the synagogue has been permitted to remain operative. Later, I ask all through Russia how many Jews are left in Russia, but I couldn't get even a vague guess. Start today, Mr. Feder, with the Moscow subway. Remember, only the stations may be filmed. You will please notice as you see them that each of the palatial stations has been designed in a different style by a different architect. Palatial is the word she uses, and I agree with her. Some stations are so deep underground that I descend in two flights of fast escalators. I'm beginning to notice that Russian crowds are incredibly quiet and orderly. More than that, somber, expressionless. The subways are all immaculate. The cleaning is done 24 hours a day. Always by women? Yes, Mr. Feder. Come, here is our train. It takes us to the end of the line. Way out here in the Moscow suburbs, there are still a few of the colorful and lovely old-style cottages left from the Tsarist days. The doors carved in wooden tracery and potted plants in the windows. But most of Moscow's suburbs are little more than log cabin shacks, reflecting the acute housing shortage. Yes, Mr. Ferris. We need many houses. So here we are building new apartments. Not Stalin architecture but put together in a new kind of prefabricated construction. Large completed sections weighing many tons are hauled in by truck and lifted into place by giant cranes. Yes, and the buildings almost visibly rise toward their ultimate 20-story height. The finishing process involves hand labor with good old-fashioned bricks and women are doing the work. 
I simply have to ask, where are the men workers, and what are they doing? The men are engaged in a more productive type of labor. Another subway ride next morning. Miss Moscow didn't show up today, replaced by a young in tourist guide who thus becomes Mr. Moscow. This is Moscow University. It is the world's largest with 26,000 students from all over the Soviet Union. And for instance, Mr. Fader turns out more engineers every year than any in your Western world. I graduated from here myself, majoring in Oriental languages, including the Chinese. And tourists insist that I see the start of the all-Russia bicycle race. Moscow to Smolensk, to Minsk and back. Eight full days of pedal pushing, with teams entered from each of the 16 Soviet republics. You see? We train their bodies as well as their minds. You recall the Olympic game? I recall all right. And it's obvious that what he says is true. Young Russia is healthy, husky, athletic-minded, and dedicated in their desire to be champions, which automatically brings the highly privileged first-class citizenship. Mr. Moscow is eloquent about his alma mater. In Russia, we graduate 500,000 university students every year. And these of Moscow University are, of course, the cream of the crop. What do these youngsters want to do when they graduate? They want to compete with the rest of the world on an equal basis. Yes, in Russia today, the emphasis is all on education. Science, engineering, physics, yes. But of other things, of the outbreak of the Hungarian revolt, for instance, they could learn from the official Moscow Bulletin only this. Capitalist-inspired rowdy students created minor disturbances in Budapest. The world-famous Bolshoi Theater is operated by the Soviet Department of Culture. Tickets must be purchased weeks in advance, but special courtesies are extended to local and foreign dignitaries and the rare Western visitor like myself. Built by the Tsars, the Bolshoi is still synonymous with ballet in all its original graceful patterns. Slip backstage during intermission, unchaperoned, and find Bolshoi artists as gracious and responsive as theatrical folks are elsewhere. Bolshoi artists are never called stars. They are designated favorites of the people, and some are bigger favorites than others. One of the most popular ballerinas is charming and friendly. She speaks a little German, and so do I. She's heard about the famous ballet institutions everywhere, the Royal Danish, the Saddler's well, but when somebody tells her I am backstage without official permission, she suddenly forgets all her German and hurries away. Next day, back to the University Stadium to see the big football game. This new Lenin Stadium is proclaimed as the largest in the world. For today's championship soccer game, Moscow University versus Kiev University, equivalent to the American Rose Bowl Classic, the stadium is jammed with 120,000 lucky football fans. Look at them. I don't understand. Are they all suspense, stunned in silence waiting for the kickoff? No, because the game is at its hectic climax. Two minutes to play, the score one to nothing, and Kiev frantically trying to tie it up. But here again, the faces I see are somber, expressionless, apathetic. Have you ever stepped out for an evening in a government-owned nightclub? Moscow is openly proud of the Metropole and its plush elegance. The orchestra plays Russian music part of the time. The 
cigarette cart, state owned, also dispenses apples, magazines, ice cream, and books. The heavy spenders are the delegation visitors from the Far East, officially inspecting Moscow nightlife. And most of the time, the music is good old American jazz. And when jazz is played, cafe society stays late, when they can afford it. For the Metropole is expensive in any month. The orchestra players are all government employees working for the Department of Culture. Another important in-tourist must in Moscow is the agricultural exhibit, a permanent fair or exposition. This 500 acres of land, of parks, fountains, the 16 individual pavilions representing the 16 Soviet republics. This I find is a preview to show the full potential of the Russian tomorrow. Although the pavilion of the Ukraine, for example, already exhibits several models of Russia's most modern farm machinery as used in that famous breadbasket of Europe. Next day to the Kremlin with Miss Moscow. Ever since 1955, Mr. Feder, the Kremlin gates have been open to visitors, but only with special permits, and we must enter through the official visitor's gate. Now our privileged visitors may have a good look at the Cathedral of the Annunciation. And here is the Assumption Cathedral of Ivan the Terrible. Through that door, many stars have passed for their coronation. I ask about an ancient fresco above that door. Isn't it a painting of the Virgin Mary? The famous cathedrals are all here, just as they were in the cathedral. Of course, no religious services are conducted in any of its churches. They are now historical show places which belong to the people. And inside, they are educational museums. Among the other relics of Tsarist days is the largest cannon in the world. and nearby, the largest bell in the world. The former Uluzania Palace is now the Armory Museum. Inside, I managed to photograph a few of the late Romanov vast treasures. Precious metal in such profusion, it begins to seem like brass and tin, but happens to be solid gold and silver. The jewel crowns and imperial paraphernalia of the Tsars are here. And another curious paradox. Carefully preserved are the holy articles of the Tsar's religious ceremonies. A huge Romanov family Bible, found in heavy sculptured gold, studded with giant diamonds. Similar gold and bejeweled prayer books, chalices, icons, altars, communion cups, crucifixes, with rubies, emeralds, and pearls, all out of the Arabian Nights. And famed relics of the Easter, once holy in Russia, the Romanov Easter Egg Collection, fabricated by the deftest goldsmiths in Europe. Jewel adorned gold and silver and platinum, enamel and ivory and hand-painted miniatures, perhaps the costliest gadgets of all time. But the number one attraction in Moscow, indeed in all Russia, is Red Square and the incredible paradox of the Lenin-Stalin mausoleum. Here on this fine, warm summer day, marshaled by white-coated guards, thousands, yes, tens of thousands, of men, women, and children line up in silent reverence. At a given signal, edge slowly forward for a precious glimpse of the embalmed bodies of the Soviet's two here-acknowledged supreme heroes. Here again is fantastic illustration of the different racial types which constitute Russia's quarter of a billion inhabitants. The white-coated gents are specially trained police because the many strangers from far off corners of the Soviet empire must be handled with care here where they are to learn the new and different way of life. Lenin and Stalin. Lenin is of course a legend, sanctified against all opinions save legend-worthy worship. But Stalin, what is Stalin today? A myth? 
How long does it take to completely dishonor a mythically glorified idol? And does the Kremlin really want to? His body is still here, beside the sainted Lenin. It's the same on this unpleasant gray winter day, with sleet turned to rain, and the temperature up from 30 below to a mere 10, yet heads are bared in reverence. It's still Lenin and Stalin here, still the wholesale silent veneration, still the miles of worshippers, still the long thin line of paradox in the vast wide sea of enigma. Important people, however, are on arrival taken at once to the head of the line, like these high dignitaries of the Yugoslav church. Here, these men of God, to pay holy tribute to two dead men who are famed, among other things, for denying God. This is Russia. Yes, this is Russia, but not all of Russia. Let's visit the Soviet Socialist Republic of Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan is, for one example, a native nomad Uzbek tribesman, endlessly wandering the glaring desert north of Afghanistan. For we're out of Europe now and deep in Central Asia. And the Uzbeks are Asiatics, a Persian, Mongol, Turkish people. For centuries, devout Muslims, proud of their own alphabet and language, and devoted to their famed Samarkand bread, in its flat, decorated loads. Uzbekistan is also the fabled city of Samarkand, today almost lost in its own hallowed antiquity, with its monumental ruins of palaces and mosques, originally built by Genghis Khan himself. My in-tourist guide here is Mr. Samarkand, who speaks some English, but brought along Miss Interpreter, a native Uzbek girl, and very gracious. They proudly point out the Russianized Asia rebuilding program in Samarkand's huge central square. The Registan, built by Tamerlane, the Iron Cripple. Many of these massive structures were once Mohammedan theological schools or madrasas, with not only classrooms but living quarters for thousands of Muslim students. For Samarkand was and is a holy territory of the Muslim world. Another ancient landmark has been left intact the Astronomical Observatory of Ola Bek, Tamlin's grandson, partly underground. Its angles and curved walls are very ingenious for the 15th century. Which proved the Russians were people of science before America was discovered. But I thought the Russians weren't even here until 1868. Getting late. Time for lunch. So we eat in this roadside restaurant. I eat my shashlik quickly. Make the excuse that I want to put the automatic camera on me cooking shashlik with the Uzbek proprietor and his Russian wife, and then wander off, alone, outside. In the mosque I casually find in a thickly shaded area, a group of Uzbeks blandly engaged in the black market sale of meat. Illicitly slaughtered lamb, a serious crime, both the slaughtering and the selling. These folks aren't aware I'm taking pictures. I doubt if any of them knows what a camera is. But one old boy, always behind me, is gradually getting angry. And a few seconds after this scene ends, follows me off, draws an old-fashioned pistol, and pulls the trigger. It doesn't go off. And he suddenly roars with laughter at the joke on himself when he realizes I'm not from the police. But I still get out of there fast. Beyond the blue mosque wall, I privately find nearby what is locally believed to be one of the holiest places in Central Asia. For here the Muslims insist that their valiant Saint Zinda will someday return from immortality at this spot to lead the Muslim world to glory. Occasionally a few pathetic Muslim nomads from the desert, afraid to actually enter the town, slip unobtrusively here as a religious pilgrimage. There's always available an old mullah a Muslim teacher, around to offer up prayers for a small fee, a plaintive sort of bootleg religion. It's here I learn of a Mohammedan mosque operative in Samarkand. I decide to find and visit the Grand Mufti, the head of all the Muslims in the district, at his home. He is entertaining four of his mullahs, is cordial, and speaks fairly good English, which helps because I didn't come here with Mr. Samarkand or even misinterpreter. 
I ask if I may attend the Mohammedan service. And on Friday, the Muslim Sabbath, the Grand Mufti himself takes me alone to the sacred confines of the age-scarred mosque. I keep thinking what this kind and gentle old man, 84 years old, said to me before the service. It is only the old men who can come to prayer. The younger men must work on Soviet schedules. So under the present regime, it's foolish to imagine that any religion can survive as long as the state does not recognize the holy days of any faith. This makes it impossible for us to observe a Ramadan, or the Catholic to observe their land, or the Protestant to observe their Sunday, or the Jews to observe their Sabbath. And go not of all who speak Mohammedanism is any hope of the highest aim of every Muslim, the dream that some rare day he might make pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca. Today the greatest reward any Muslim may look forward to is an official trip to Moscow. Not the holy Mecca. Moscow. Next day, the marketplace of Marco Polo is an in-tourist must. Here in the midst of ancient history are the new white buildings of Soviet state shops. And here in the footprints of the Mongol conquerors walk the MVD police with their modern methods. This Samarkand is now Russia. Around another Uzbek oasis grew up the sprawling Asiatic city of Tashkent. Here I see machinery, road-making machinery, always drawing a crowd of curious Uzbek inhabitants. I ask why women laborers. Mr. Tashkent and Miss Interpreter chat a moment in Russian. These women are specially trained colonial workers they go wherever they are needed in any part of Russia. Tashkent has many broad new avenues and modern buildings. And renowned throughout the scientific world is the Tashkent Academy of Sciences. But only its distant front can be photographed, with the accompanying collegiate statuary glorifying athletic prowess. Tashkent University has its own sports stadium where its colonial students practice the required and cherished athletics. Everywhere in Tashkent I see Russian soldiers. They're called border guards and they have their own special uniforms. But Tashkent is 200 miles from the border. The MVD is also here. And this one doesn't seem to like being photographed. They handle everything from traffic control to market inspection. Tashkent is known as Textile Town. And next day we're to visit a cooperative cotton plantation. The sign says the future will be bright for our children if we raise more cotton. The black ball shows the workers are exceeding their quarters. We pass through field after field of cotton, being hand-picked, almost all the workers women, Asiatic women. Next, we stop at a state-owned plantation. Here, Miss Interpreter isn't sure I'm allowed to take pictures. I'll have to wait for the supervisor. But before he arrives, I manage to photograph these youthful laborers some of whom seem below the Soviet minimum child labor age of 16. Miss Interpreter objects. These are not workers. They are young Soviet citizens learning a trade. At the textile mill, the supervisor catches up with us. This Interpreter translates for him his pride in this project for which he is responsible. He says the Soviet Union is now independent of the rest of the world in cotton. This mill processes cotton from the raw material which comes in at one end to the printed fabric which goes out the other. 
This is the largest textile mill in the world. I ask about visiting the other factories in the area. I'm told there are seven, each employing 12,000 people. Oh, no. It is not forbidden. But a letter would have to be written and a special permit secure for Moscow. And this would be very difficult. By now I know this means there's not the barest chance I'll get near those factories. Nor could anyone I met in all Russian Asia tell me what is being made in those factories I couldn't see. As we leave, Misinterpreter translates a message from the workers for me to take back to the Western world. Please tell the people of your country that the Soviet citizens of Central Asia do not want war. We are a simple-minded and peaceful people. This is Russia, ruled from the Kremlin. But there's more, much more of Russia. Let's take a look at the Soviet Socialist Republic of the Ukraine. The good ship Lens Soviet is to take me across the Black Sea to the Crimea. My end tourist ticket provides me with a deluxe cabin, roomy and comfortable. Its radio speaker brings in only the voice of the Kremlin broadcasts, with no switch to turn it off. My fellow passengers seem to be about 70% military. The others I find are scientists, teachers, theatrical folks, workers from all walks of life, being rewarded for some exceptional service to the Soviet state. For them, this voyage is an earned and organized holiday. Anchored off Sevastopol, but completely out of sight of the naval base, large personnel launches take off the lads in uniform. Our next stop, the magical, mythical paradise of regimented vacations. Yalta, the pride of the Red Riviera. Here, Mr. Intourist Yalta takes me over. Our schedule starts with the largest sanitaria in the world. It was formerly a style summer palace, but is now the official rest resort of the forestry workers of Russia. Almost all our stations have a rest home. This is one of the rooms occupied by the late President Roosevelt during the Yalta Conference. The room is now a dormitory for forestry workers. From a window I can see far below, the Strand, a winding promenade lined with more huge white sanatorias and park-like plazas, the whole gay picture lavishly decorated with wisteria, cypress, magnolias, linen, and stalin. Sometimes the vacationers merely congregate in quiet groups. But when I start taking movies, they often crowd around and actually relax. I soon learn why away from whom the Soviet worker is less constrained. No one knows him here, and hence isn't as likely to report his activities. But their ignorance of the Western world is shocking. On all sides, I hear the same question. Is it true the poor workers in Los Angeles have to go into debt to buy automobiles because it's too far to walk to the capitalist factory? Why don't American people want peace as much as the Russians do? They're eager. They're hungry for news of the outside world but simply can't believe what you tell them, even to the purchasing power of a $5 bill. Next morning, I'm driven up into the nearby hills to be shown a movie studio's out-of-door sets, escorted by Miss Yalta. Your guide of yesterday, Mr. Fedor, is today with a visiting delegation because he speaks Chinese. I am only recently within Turkey. I was a state artist myself with the ballet, so I am very happy to visit my colleagues at the cinema. We meet the star of the movie, a 17-year-old girl whose face bears that ineffable something which photographs. Ms. Shalta proudly informs me that all movie studios and theaters are operated by the Soviet Department of Culture. I leave her on the movie set happily engrossed and stroll around the hillside to discover a road-building crew, members of a teenage organization called the Young Pioneer Girl Workers. Then I return to the movie location, 
where I find Miss Yorba so happy, she takes me to a former czarist pavilion, now a military post, and not only brings out a couple of the officers, but allows me to photograph her with them. Nice, isn't she? Be even nicer in a closer shot, but she says this is not permitted without a special permit. But tomorrow, the schedule again. Miss Yalta and I drive to a state school to witness the gala celebration of a graduating class. I can see why this is an in-tourist must, for the children are impressively healthy and well-dressed, including the red neckerchiefs which are always worn as emblems of their youthful patriotism. The graduation ceremony is entirely a tribute to the Soviet teachers, so no parents are present but some of the youngsters carry flowers sent by proud father or mother who is off somewhere busy at work. Let's visit the capital of the Ukraine, the city of Kiev. I already know quite a bit about Kiev. A friend of mine was born here in Mother Russia. I know that 85% of Kiev was completely destroyed in World War II. So somewhere beneath this newly rebuilt city, Beneath all these modern structures, the state-owned shops, the groups of tourists from the far corners of all Russia, the Stalin architecture skyscrapers, beneath all this is buried the powdered dust and ashes of the old city, including that ancient ghetto where lived the largest Jewish population in Europe. That is, until Hitler and then Stalin decimated it to the present 30,000. But Miss Kiev doesn't want to discuss that. Oh, yes, meet Miss Kiev. She is a cheerful, bustling chain smoker, about 22 years old. She speaks good English, is so new to her in-tourist job that I am her first customer. For several days, she shows me what I'm supposed to see, including her own college, the University of Kiev, where she majored in languages. And this is our university park, overlooking the Dnieper River. You can see that everyone here is studying or reading. Nothing is more important to us than learning. The boy wants the advantages which come with achievement in science, medicine, and engineering. The girl? Well, a woman has to have a job. The better the education, the better the job. Yes, feminine charm and attractiveness don't seem important. And even family life comes second to their work. Many are reading English. Such books as the H.G. Wells, science fiction. More than one is buried in Theodore Dreiser's An American Tragedy. And a 15-year-old is absorbed by Jack London. What's your favorite English reading, I asked Miss Kiev. She smiled. I love Robinson Crusoe. He was such a good worker. Then I turned my long Zumar lens on the river. You must not do that, sir. You have no special permission to photograph those factories across the river. Factories? I don't see any factories. Neither do I, but that atomic lens on your camera can see farther than the human eye and will photograph things 20 miles away. For an apprentice guide, Miss Kiev seems pretty well indoctrinated. But as if to make amends, she asks some soldiers to pose before the statue of St. Vladimir, who brought Christianity to Russia in the 10th century. In his honor was built the beautiful Vladimir Cathedral. The church is open and well filled. Today is Sunday, even though not observed as such in Russia. But the congregation consists mostly of elderly women, some old men, and a few children. Where are all the young people, I asked Miss Kiev. You saw them at the university yesterday. Religion is for backward people only. These elderly people remember the old days. But soon they will be gone and out of the way. It's young Russia we're interested in. Bright and early next morning, she's back with more schedule, the Lenin Park. Here is a manual training school, where youngsters are taught to be railway workers by actually being engineers, firemen, conductors, and switchmen under the supervision of an adult technician. Everything about the railway is realistic, a smaller version of the standard Russian train. See how seriously the children go about it. This is not play. Their faces show their adult gravity. The children are thinking only of what they are learning. 
If they do not learn well, they will not earn their membership in the Young Komsomol, the Junior Communist League, and that would make them very unhappy, just like children all over the world. Yes, just like children all over the world. Only these have already been drilled into that adult gravity, which, everywhere I go, is the face and the faces of Russia. This, then, is the Russian accent on youth, adult gravity for children. Next day, to a collective farm, where the farm director explains that this is a collective of 500 families. They pool their labors to work this state-owned land, and each family, as well as the combined group, must meet certain monthly quotas of farm products. Later that afternoon, I get my first real personal contact with the Russian worker himself, or in this case, ourselves. For once again, except for the male supervisor, the men seem to be somewhere else on more productive efforts. This is the Ukraine, the breadbasket of Europe. And I couldn't help but think back to the agricultural exhibit in Moscow and the Ukraine pavilion with those modern farming machines used in the Ukraine. This is the Ukraine, the government of which is far away in the Kremlin, which also governs the Soviet Socialist Republic of Georgia. Georgia, ancient Georgia, in the long shadows of the Caucasus Mountains. Georgia with its 20 centuries of bloody struggle for independence until it fell to Russian conquest in 1801. Georgia, with its tiny town of Gori, and enormous for such a small place, it's Stalin City Hall, begun by Stalin himself, but when he died, was never finished. But still standing and beautifully maintained is the Stalin Shrine, the marble pavilion which frames and encloses the tiny wooden cottage, where was born in 1879 to a family named Zugashvili, a little boy who later called himself Joseph Stalin. In Russian and also in Georgian, for the languages are entirely dissimilar, the tourist is informed that Comrade Stalin, the great leader of progressive humanity, lived here in his childhood. There are two rooms with meager furnishings, adorned with pictures of Lenin, of Father Zugashvili, who was a shoemaker, and Mother Zugashvili, and the little Zugashvili boy grown up. The current rumors in Georgia that Stalin's body will be moved here. There are also many other rumors among the Georgians who often rebelled against Stalin, but he still has his statues all over the place. Halfway from Gori to the Georgian capital, Tbilisi, or Tiflis, is the ancient town of Svetis Tokavili. Here are the ruins of a fourth century Arab fort. The Georgians fought the invading Arabs, too. Overlook a sixth century Christian cathedral which hasn't closed its doors since the days of Tamerlane. In the theological seminary of this cathedral, Joseph Stalin, as a young man, studied to prepare himself for the priesthood. I think it's not unfair to say he didn't make it. Georgian priests have, as a matter of record, declared themselves independent of the Russian Orthodox Church, quite regardless of whether it exists elsewhere or not. I see truckloads of Russian troops on the roads of Georgia, contrasting with the frequent flocks of sheep brought down from the hills by native Georgians, who, as you can see, are quite different from the other Russians we visited. Georgia is agriculturally the Soviet's second richest republic, outranked only by the Ukraine. Here again, I see the women are doing the work. The capital of Tiflis is an old, old city. And if you don't think Georgians are hard to handle, Look at all the old stone forts on the hilltops commanding the city. For the ancient Greeks, the before-mentioned Arabs, the invading early Romans, and the marauding Mongols from Asia, all had their hands full keeping the Georgians on their Sunday behavior. Here I am told of banners recently paraded, reading, Long Live the Independent Georgian Republic. My in-tourist guide and interpreter, Mr. Tiflis, is young and Russian not Georgia. At the university, he surprisingly tells the local joke that the iron gates are not to keep the Georgian students in, but the Russian soldiers out, since the grounds are regularly patrolled. When the Kremlin decreed this institution be renamed Stalin Tiflis University, the student body rioted in favor of the old name, University of Georgia. One such demonstration resulted in 300 students wounded or killed. 
There are no traffic problems in Tiflis, unless you count the gypsies coming into town from the outlands to barter off some sheep or goats. And apparently this private enterprise is officially winked at. But recently the Kremlin announced that the 300,000 wandering gypsies here in Southeast Europe must register. The gypsies say Moscow wants to conscript them into labor units. So they pop into town, conduct a little free enterprise, and are gone. Late that afternoon, I slip out of the Inn Tourist Hotel for a look at the vast spaces of Lenin Square. But across the square, I see a disturbance. A small riot starts in a bus between some students and an MVD man. In Moscow, the crowd would have instantly scattered in fear. But here in Georgia, everybody likes a good fight. I hurry over, too, and promptly get arrested by the MVD. This may be freedom-loving Georgia, but it's also Russia. And so is Sochi on the Black Sea, more famous than Yorba for organized vacation. Miss Sochi of In Tourist meets me here. She brings my schedule and shows me its required aspects of Sochi. The clean, wide streets, the lovely parks and statues, and the many blooming flower beds. Noting who's doing the work, I ask Miss Sochi the obvious question. Why are women doing these jobs? I get a new answer. Because it's glorious to work. What are the men workers doing? Some work is more glorious. I give up on that subject. 300,000 Russian workers are giving vacations in Sochi each year. And 16 more sheep are being added to the Black Sea luxury fleet. This, Mr. Feder, is the magnificent Stalin Opera House. Here, you may have a choice. You may go inside now free as an official tourist or pay 32 rubles for a ticket and see a performance. I look at Miss Sochi. How about two tickets? She nods, accepts my 64 rubles, and departs for the inn tourist office, leaving me to examine the billboards, which announce both Grand Opera and the nationally famous Moesia Company in a folk ballet. At curtain time, bringing the two tickets, who arrives? Miss Sochi? No. A bespectacled young man, Mr. Sochi. Mr. Sochi announces we will visit the Black Sea bathing beaches. I recall reading that here they sometimes go bathing in the healthy all together. Or at least I did positively hear that the girls wear bikinis. The beach is not sand. It's hard, sharp stone. But the sun is shining brightly and the vacationers are getting their sun tan. This is a sex-segregated area for men only. And the girls are all beyond that canvas wall. But here on another beach, sex desegregation. The males and the females are permitted to mingle. And it's the men who wear the bikini. Here, official beach regulations advise you the proper exercises to perform in order to be strong and healthy. But those lifeguards in the little rowboats, I turn to ask Mr. Sochi what they're looking at. And he in answer turns me back again to see a girl just emerging from the water. And Mr. Sochi says that next on my schedule is something even lovelier. It's flowers. Sochi's famous flowers. Thousands and thousands of gorgeous blooms. And here the visiting vacationers come to look in amazement at blossoms they've never before seen or heard of. And because the state furnishes them vacation transportation, room, board, everything including free movies, 
The vacationers have rubles to spend, and literally nothing else to spend them for but the finest flowers in the world. But over in the food department, two trucks unload a batch of surplus new potatoes. And quickly, the local Sochi householders crowd around and line up to buy. Mr. Sochi isn't happy about me photographing this. Mr. Fedder, the flowers make brighter pictures. So we go back to the flower department and watch the vacationing visitors to whom all this beauty is a happy revelation. It's my last day with Mr. Sochi. Today our luxury ship Russia makes it a memorable one for 425 Soviet citizens. For the first time since the revolution, a Russian ship is to make a pleasure cruise around Europe, allowing the average Soviet citizen to meet and to mix with the people of the capitalist world. Some weeks later in the harbor at Havre, France, I see the good ship Russia again and learn that two of the average Soviet citizens on board are a Miss Bulganin and a Miss Krusha. This is Russia, where the Kremlin handles everything. It also handles the million square miles of the Soviet Socialist Republic of Kazakhstan. You fly in Russia only by state-owned airlines. En route, I photograph across the Tian Shan Mountains to China, where atop these mountains is the boundary line between Kazakhstan and the Chinese province of Xinjiang. Kazakhstan's capital, the city of Alma-Ata, which means father of apples, boasts a new railway station. The sign reads, save your money in the Soviet bank of Alma-Ata. This is a Russianized Asiatic city, even to an old Russian custom the rollicking fancy dress and burlesque makeup of a Russian wedding celebration. Alma Ata Market. I have two in-tourist escorts. Mr. Alma Ata, who speaks no English, and a Russian girl, Miss Alma Ata, educated in Shanghai, whose English is fluent and British. The Alma Ata Market is new and bustling with its large, crowded conglomeration of Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Turkmen, and others so Mongolian they might just have come from China. The market sells everything from fresh meat, freely exposed for the customer to examine, to roll your own tobacco, and second-hand clothing and an occasional little private enterprise on the side. In this kindergarten, the native children make it very clear that geographically we're deep in Oriental Asia. To be exact, we're directly north of New Delhi, India, about a thousand miles north. And I'm reminded of the Russianized Asia program, for these youngsters are starting out that way. Segregated in a school for 100% Kazakhs with 100% communist-trained Russian teachers. Here the little Soviet citizens of Asia are having their outdoor recreation hour, while Miss Alma Atta explains. These Kazakh youngsters are taught exactly the same things as the children of Moscow and in the Russian language. There would be no sense in them learning about the old Kazakh ways for them, they did not have the glorious freedom they are enjoying now. Just look at them, Mr. Feather. I look, and all I see on the little oriental faces is adult gravity. Next day, we encounter a parade of students from the Kazakh Academy of Sciences. Both Russians and Kazakhs march side by side, a proportion about 50-50. The banners say, forward together as brotherly champions of peace. They are marching to the Academy Park to receive awards for their athletic achievements. But here I see the Russian undergraduates lined up by themselves in one separate group. And the native Kazakh students gather together in another. That evening, Miss Alma Ad and I are to attend the concert at the Lenin Opera House. The house is packed, almost entirely with Asiatic Russians.
Next, my in-tourist chaperons take me on a motor trip up into the Tian Shan Mountains. This is wheat and apple country. Those apple trees remind me of my husband. He is a tree surgeon working in Siberia. And here, higher up, is grazing country. State-owned sheep country. The sheep herders wear the padded Kazakh jacket against the cold. And here, still higher up, is a mountain village called Cherin, where the local agricultural fair exhibits the products of the region. The fair won't be open for several days, but the director will show us some of the wonders of Kazakhstan, the largest vegetables in the world. This is a most important exhibit, and official delegations from Egypt and Romania will be here next week. Before we leave, I ask Miss Alma Atta and Mr. Alma Atta to pose together for my camera. But she abruptly declines and moves quickly aside. Suddenly, our mountain road climbs to a dead-end stop. My in-tourist escorts admit we're lost and confer in Russian. This seems to be a summer resort. The sign says, bonds of friendship in ancient world bring peace to all. But the word P-A-I-X means peace in French. French? Here a few miles from China, a summer resort. Beyond it, I explore a little, and I find a huge road building project. A new four-lane highway is under construction. A new four-lane highway heading east. Straight for where? My in-tourist guides say they don't know. So I christen it the road to nowhere, and they laugh. I don't mention that my private classification is the road to tomorrow. I wonder if it's called the road to tomorrow within the walls of the Kremlin, which now permits me to see the Paris of Russia, the once imperial city of Leningrad, where in tourist escorts me to the 55-year-old Hotel Astoria. From the hotel, we make our way first to the main thoroughfare, the Nevsky Prospect, principal shopping center lined with state-owned shops and stores. Miss Leningrad turns out to be intelligent, earnest, and never at a loss for words. Leningrad is the greatest city in the world for culture parks and museums. And here, enjoying our parks, are some of our Leningrad children. You see, Mr. Feder, after the child is born, the state takes charge, so the mother can get back to work as soon as possible. Leningrad's parks are called culture parks because, for instance, of a statue of Catherine the Great. She ruled Russia for 34 years, enjoyed numerous lovers, and had them all put to death. More parks, more culture, a woman bootblack releasing another man for more productive labor. More ice cream. Ice cream is very popular, I mentioned. Of course. It is excellent food, good for everyone. But we must hurry, Mr. Feder, to the next thing on our schedule. The former Winter Palace has been combined with the Hermitage Museum, making it the largest museum in the world. Some of these art treasures are recent acquisitions. We rescued them from the Nazis, who had looted them from the famous museums of Europe. Four hours later, we're both worn out. Let's call it a day. Tomorrow, I'd like to see the famous Kirov Stadium. Not tomorrow, Mr. Petter. The Kirov Stadium is closed. But next morning, she secured a special permit for me to see the Kirov Stadium. It's not closed. It's very busy. It's just as I've seen it in pictures. Only Stalin's portrait is no longer beside Lenin. Several thousand people seem to be practicing something to instructions blared out of loudspeakers. I can see students, workers, athletes, and many uniform groups. What is this? Not until next day do I see the official news bulletin.
that a gentleman named Tito was coming to town. And I then knew that what I'm seeing now is a rehearsal for one of those spontaneous manifestations demonstrating the popularity of some visitor who is, at the moment, very popular in Russia. Tomorrow, we drive north from Leningrad to another palace. This was built by Peter the Great, so that on a clear day he could study the coast of Finland. I'm afraid we can't go inside. It's being made over as a culture and rest resort, but we can take a walk down along the fountain. We've walked a lot. Why don't you rest while I have a look at Finland? On the other side of the palace, I find a group of laborers. Teenage young pioneer workers again. Young pioneer program is a special part of the Soviet educational pattern. Here, for students not engaged in technical and scientific achievements, there is special emphasis on the practical labor trade. And these young girls are doing their classroom work. Suddenly, Miss Leningrad appears at my side. For what interest could this be to you, Mr. President? I mildly explain that in my country, such work is usually done by men. These patriotic young girls are freeing men for other work. Come, we must hurry. We hurry. I photograph this village while my in-tourist folks are repairing a blow-up. It's typical of hundreds of villages I saw throughout the Soviet. This is the first I could film. Judging by the antennas, there's television for everybody. But before the blowout is repaired, my camera is back in its case, and I proceed with the official sights. For several more days, I see what they want me to see. More palaces, more churches. But when I ask to see inside certain cathedrals, Miss Leningrad says they are not on my schedule. Finally, I say I'm tired, and today I'll go back to the hotel for lunch. But I skip lunch, slip out and take a Packard-type taxi, the Cathedral of the Virgin of Kazan, where, unchaperoned, I can't get past the guards to go inside. Then quickly on to the Church on the Blood. No soap here, either, but I manage a quick look in. It's now a warehouse for the theatrical scenery of the Leningrad Opera. It's an easy walk to the magnificent Cathedral of St. Isaac. Here, the guards are willing for me to enter, but take my cameras away. I soon find out why. For St. Isaac's is one of the official Soviet institutes of anti-religion. Inside, this church is filled with paintings and murals showing the evils of religion. One depicts a bloated, cigar-smoking capitalist, bullwhip in hand, riding on a golden cross, carried by tortured peasants, preceded by Christ clad in glittering gold. On another wall, a painting of the Pope. When looked at sideways, the Holy Father wears the head of a jackass. Again, Christ is shown and named as the Jewish fortune teller. And in other unspeakable poses, but I'd seen enough. No wonder they didn't let me take pictures inside. And before I got my cameras back, I saw two culture teachers bringing a group of little children into the front door. This is Russia, the Russia of the Kremlin. Not the Kremlin of museums and sightseers, but this the most widely discussed group of buildings in the world today. So exclusive there are special NVD police to prevent anyone not authorized from even crossing the street to approach. For this is the Soviet Union's supreme headquarters that governs the most completely governed empire on Earth, that can command the every human effort of a quarter of a billion people to its own desire, thus producing tremendous achievements in the technical science. But it also brings to the Russian people what I have seen in their faces. And what of the Russian people living under this paradox of power? On my last night at the Moscow Hotel, strange noises arose from Red Square up to my bedroom. I take a camera and hurry down eight flights of stairs. What's going on here? Here in the semi-darkness and the temperature below zero. Through the pre-dawn gloom, I see students, young workers. Here are thousands of people watching other thousands of people parading. 
The marchers all seem to know exactly the right formations to pass in front of the reviewing stand. But the reviewing stand is empty. There isn't a living soul up there to see the demonstration. There isn't a living soul up there for the marchers to salute. It can't be a parade, for they march across Red Square in one direction, then turn around and march back again. Why this manifestation? Why so senselessly early before sunrise? Who ordered all these battalions of marchers to come and march? Who ordered all these thousands of shivering spectators to come and approve? Who? Only the Kremlin could. Why? Only the Kremlin knows. The Kremlin, which has its own purpose for everything it does. And what that purpose is, concerns the world. The banners say, forward to victory through communism. This then is that nation which first flung an astonishing man-made satellite into the skies above us. This is Russia. 